if you've sinned, because somebody, you know, think about falling short of the grace of God is when somebody's continually sinning and stuff like that. That's a whole other issue. But cutting yourself off from the grace of God has got to do with trying to keep and to do the law and not walking in the law spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which is from the heart and faith and love. All right, now, I, I need y'all's help in this, okay, to really push this down. And really, when you come out of here, you know without a shadow of a doubt how to walk in grace consistently. Instead of y'all, instead of saying this, this way, that because I, I really feel like a lot of times I'm, I'm, I'm either in my own life too or with other people, and they feel like they're rolling dice in relationship to accessing the grace of God. And, uh, and so with that said, let's real quick look at some really big benefits you see in Scripture in relationship to grace. Here is my definition of grace, and we'll see how it measures out. My definition of grace is in how I understand Scripture. Grace takes you to a level you cannot attain on your own. So I couldn't, leave, I couldn't live the Jesus life on my own. So what I did was, is that I, I operated in the grace, and the grace took me to that level of living. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So the measure that God has destined you to walk in toward Dorcas is to love her to the same level that Jesus loves the church. Now, y'all, if Q tries to perform that and says, okay, I'm going to love Dorcas like Christ loved the church. I'm going to do it. Can we say butt-kicking material? There ain't no way he can do it. I've tried it. <laughs> it don't work. You know, how about 1 Peter 2.21 we looked last week? To this Q was called. Since Christ suffered for him, you know, that he would follow in Jesus' steps. And the next verse says, who committed no sin. Now, I could ask Dorica, since they've been married, is Q sin? And, and I don't want to put them in that place right now. <laughs> but I would say that's true. So to that level of living here, or, or Matthew 5, 48, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Or 1 Peter 1, 17, be holy as I am holy. Freedom, it's freedom that Christ set us free. We know that's here fullness. So all of this is here. So Q came, might work it out. So grace takes him to that level of living. So you can be cut off from that grace and not experience this. So grace only comes from the Lord, though. It's not for one of us to extend out to someone else. That's where mercy comes in, correct? It knows both. It is. Okay. And yeah, we'll talk about that. That's a great question, Dan. Yeah. Mercy, mercy you give when you what? Blow it. Grace takes you to a level of living you can't attain on your own. So, Paul, in my relationship with her, I, she can, she can, I can blow it with her. In fact, there's times she said, Rick, don't, all I can do with you right now is just do the sin chart, you know, the forgiveness chart, you know, because I kept blowing it. But grace, when she operates with grace toward me, is that it takes, she empowers me to go to that level of living. Um, example, here's one way she can do it. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but that which only gives grace to the hearer. So one of the ways that we can give grace is to speak grace. In other words, don't speak where somebody's at. You speak words to where they're where they're going. Let me give you an example of this. Mercy and grace at the same time. It happens. One time I'm in a, le I'm in a leaders meeting at Dwelling Place. Paul is in the room and Mitch and Leah were in the room. Some others were in the room and, you know, there's a whole bunch of other leaders in the room. Well, there was this lady that asked this question. It was kind of different. And, and I kind of was not in the spirit in it. So I spoke it, kind of corrected it kind of hard. So anyway, you know, and then, you know, the meeting proceeded and things were, went okay. So the meeting ended. <laughs> this is weird. This is when you know you're in trouble. So the meeting ended and people start funneling out. Paula 
and Mitch and Leah, they're not moving. And I'm, you know, I'm standing there, I'm just saying, talking to people as they're leaving out, but Paul and Mitch and Leary, they're just sitting there. And so after everybody left the room, Paula said, Rick, sit down, please. And she goes, uh, Rick, I, I just want you to know that when you spoke to so-and-so, that wasn't the heart of the father. And when she said that, it was like, boom, she hit me in the gut. Because guess what? So... How did she, what did she do? She, she revealed the heart of the father to me. The heart of the father speaks love, speaks grace. Well, she, she did two things at one time. She revealed, okay, I was not operating in that. And she was calling me to it. You know, she didn't say, oh, Rick, you, that was stupid. You shouldn't have spoke to her that way, stuff like that. She spoke to me what the heart of the father was. And, or like one another passage of scripture that where you see it, like in Colossians chapter three, verse eight and nine, it says, do not lie to one another since you have laid aside the old self with its evil practices. So in other words, you're addressing an area of sin in somebody's life, but how you're addressing it is you're speaking grace into them. Y'all following me? You're not, you're not speaking where they're at. You're speaking into them where God's calling them to go. And if they entertain actions that are contrary to that, then they deal with it. Don't lie. Why? That's not who you are. And that's what I remember one time. Well, I've done this more than once. You know, my, one of my kids, you know, would speak, up, speak something that wasn't true. And I would look at him and I'd say, that's not who you are. That's not, that's not who you are. Don't entertain that. And so, so I'm trying to speak grace at the same time. I'm, I'm, I'm given mercy to forgive, but I'm speaking grace to try to call them to this level of living who they called into. Does that sort of, that's one of the ways you give grace. And uh, we'll talk about some more here in a second. So it works. It's big in relationships, husband and wife relationships. Because uh, in husband and wife relationship, we have a tendency not to operate in grace. But uh, contrary to grace would be the cues. You know, and where you see like in, in 1 Corinthians 13, love does not take into account wrong suffered. You know, I remember early days in Paul and I's relationships. Well, we would really good be good at doing. I remember you know, you did this, this, and this. You know, you'd bring up something a number of years ago. I remember that. Yeah, you did that. Well, that's not grace. That's not love. That's not mercy. Because love doesn't take into account wrong suffered. You, it doesn't mean you brush away sin, but what you're doing is you're dealing with it in a different way. Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not that of in, in that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Okay. So I couldn't save myself. So grace releases salvation into my life. All right, look at go to Romans chapter six, verse 14. For sin shall not be your master, <laughs> for you are not under law, but under grace. Have you been memorizing? <laughs> Is that one of y'all's types of scriptures? <laughs> okay. Sin shall not have master over you because you're not under this, but under grace. So in other words, you want to get victory over sin in life? How do you do it? Grace. Operating under the law of Moses is not going to empower you to get victory over sin. So grace saves us. Take the that attain a living. Grace gives us the power and authority to get victory over sin. Uh, go to uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 32, I believe it is. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Okay. What is the word? First off, I, give, I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is, notice what it said, able to, what? Build you up and give you an inheritance. So grace saves us. Grace enables us to get saved, which we couldn't save ourselves. 
Grace gives us in victory over sin. We couldn't get victory over sin on our own. Grace builds us up, and grace gives us inheritance. That's from one beginning to the end. So grace is pretty stout. Okay, now here's a question, Pat. In one sentence, pressure's on. Somebody says, you got 10 seconds, or else the earth's going to blow up. Some kind of radical, stupid thing. But anyway, unless you know what the word of grace is, what is the word of grace? But Pat knows I love her, and she, you know, I think she's awesome. But, but uh, that's, a, that's why one of the reasons why I spoke it was because life is in a way that puts pressure on us. And we don't have time to think about how to operate in grace. We need to know it here, not here, because, y'all, there's times that, you know, that you're facing situations in life, uh, you know, where hardcore situations where you cannot, you know, like Paula gets word, you know, she's got cancer. Y'all, that, that don't want to beat you down. When we get through here, hopefully in one sentence, you'll know what it means, the word of his grace, how to walk in grace. Grace does this. Okay, now, and we were dealing with the definition of totally unmerited favor. Well, notice how I worded that statement, totally unmerited favor. Because there's a facet of grace that is totally unmerited. Totally unmerited. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now watch this. What we're seeing is an equation here. Grace equals... In Christ Jesus. What I want to show you is God has given us a reservoir of grace in Christ Jesus. Totally unmerited. I come to Q and I give Q a check for a million dollars. Does Q have a million dollars? Not yet. Q has to do what? Cash it. Cash it. Or I say, Q, I got a, I got a checking account that has a million dollars in it. Here's the ATM card. Access it. A million dollars can be sitting there, but Q can be rich, have access to riches, and never access it. He could die a pauper rich. In fact, there's testimonies of people who died poor only to find out later, the people found out later that they were totally rich because they didn't understand the inheritance they had already received. See, this reserv there's a reservoir of grace. Listen to this passage in, in Romans chapter 5, verse 15. The free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of one many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by, in, literally, in the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. many. So Jesus is, God's gift of Jesus to us is a gift of grace. So guess what? It's totally unmerited. Romans 5.15. But the free gift does not let the transgression, for if by the transgression of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift of, by grace, by the, in, in the gift, by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ abound to many. So the gift of grace abound to the many. Okay? So there's a reservoir of grace. But watch verse 17. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. The traditional definition of grace is unmerited favor. We disproved that that, that means that. 
grace means he takes us to a level we cannot attain on our own. And we talked about things that it talks about in that. For by grace are you saved, sin gives victory over sin. Grace is not totally unmerited favor. And there's one part of it, it's, to, it's unmerited. This. There's, God get, gave this and it's totally unmerited. You don't deserve the bank account. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. He gives it to us. But now look in the middle of verse 17 that Q read. Read it again, Q. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Pen. Does Q have the pen? Nah. Q, I'm gonna give Q guy needs to get this pen, this million dollar pen. What's Q got to do? Take it. <laughs> now he's received it. Notice the key. Notice the key phrase there. Those who receive the abundance of grace. Receive it. Here's my question. Are we what? Receiving it. Receiving it. An interesting thing about that verb, y'all. This verb in relationship to verse 17. That verb is not point action. It is what's called a present participle, which means continuous action. It has a, has a meaning like this, not point action. What a lot of times we go, okay, I've, I've got God's grace. Boom. No. No. The question is, for every one of us in this room, are we receiving it? Are you receiving it? And I don't know about y'all, but uh, I leak. <laughs> so, I mean, I need grace all the time, all the time. How, how do I receive God's grace? You know, I go, you know, Dan, okay, receive God's grace. Receive it. And what we'll do is religion will go, okay, let me pray for you. Okay, Dan, you know, just receive now. Just put yourself in neutral. Now receive it. I'm being in those services, you know. Oh, how do you, tomorrow morning when you get up, how do you receive the grace of God? Tomorrow morning when I get up, how do I walk in grace? Okay, what gives God a legal right to give you grace? Receive. So what gives God a legal right to release this to here? Because let me tell you something. Isaiah 30, 18 says, the Lord waits on high to have compassion on you. He longs to be gracious to you. Uh, in fact, um, you know, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, God is able to make what? All grace abound to you. That you, goes on to say that always having all sufficient every, it's a really a bunch of alls and everys there. So you may have abundance for every good deed. Whoa. And so let, I, here's, here's, a, here's a really something to look at. Is it possible for us to walk in this abundant grace? Go, go with me to Acts chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 33. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and abundant grace was upon them all. Get that. Abundant grace was upon them all. And notice what was associated with this abundant grace. At the first part of that verse, what, Q? Great power. Great power. Abundant grace. Abundant grace. Go to, go to Acts chapter 6. Here's one of my favorite past scriptures. You ever had anybody tell you you're full of it? Well... Interesting, Stephen, Acts chapter 6, verse 8. Stephen was full of it. That's 433. 
And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and abundant grace was upon them all. So you're saying that wasn't just also abundant grace was upon them, that it was upon them because they were giving testimony? I think it was, I think my personal thing is they were connected. Okay. I just wondered because yeah, I, I, mean, I didn't question. make that kind of a connection. Watch this, Acts chapter six. What did I say? Verse eight? Yep. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. Notice what was associated with grace there again. Full of grace and power. Full of grace. Full of grace. So we're seeing the possibility, y'all, that we can walk in abundant grace and full of grace. And what my conviction, my understanding is, y'all, and when I'm in walking in this grace, I'm walking in the abundance of this. And God is able to do some powerful things in my life and in around my life. What gives God legal right to give you grace? The reality is I don't have to talk God into giving me grace. In fact, he's already given it. The question is, it's here. The question is, how do I, according to Romans 5, 17, receive it? Now, you said something, John, but I want to go before that. What gives God a legal right to give us grace? Go with me to Romans chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. We want to be under this spout of grace right here, where this is happening in our lives. The law came in so that trans the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grace reigns through. Preposition is this, dia. And dia means through. It's the picture of John <laughs> is going to, draw water through a straw. Dia, through the straw. And that thing that John's got, if there's no straw, he ain't gonna get no water. Well, you can, but it's gonna be difficult. So grace reigns through what? Righteousness. The righteousness. So when righteousness is established in my life, God can give me grace. Or let's put it this way. It releases grace into my life. Now, y'all, it's interesting to me that the book of Romans, the Romans chapter 3 through 8, and Galatians chapter 2 through 5, 4, 5, all the big question is, how is righteousness established? First, you got to ask a question before that. What does righteousness mean? And it's real simple. Really, righteousness literally means that which is right. So what, what the law of Moses said, if I can do what is right, then righteousness is established. But the law of spirit, spirit of life in Christ Jesus says something else, something different. But before we do that, I got to say something else about righteousness. When you think about righteousness, there's two things that you need to be aware. Go to Romans chapter 4, 2. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So when you talk about righteousness, what you need to be aware of, now this is controversial what I'm about to say, what I'm teaching you. Some of y'all probably never heard this. Been around me. There are two things about righteousness to be aware. There's what I call my description, acts of righteousness. Abraham believed God, 
and it was counted to him as righteousness. That was a righteous act. Go with me to Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Notice what Jesus is talking about here. This is the Beatitudes, and this is all about the law, spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And notice what he says, something here is really kind of controversial in our day and time. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Notice what he says, practicing your righteousness. And what he starts talking about is he starts talking about prayer. He starts talking about fasting. He starts talking about uh, giving. We're seeing acts of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That we, what? Might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So what I call, this is my term, I don't know how really good it is, but it's what I call the condition of righteousness or another, another way to say it, maybe the state of righteousness. In other words, in the, in the courtroom of heaven, you're righteous. You're righteous. So God made him who knew no sin become sin for us. And notice how it words it. That we, it, notice it doesn't say that we will become the righteousness of God. Notice what it says. That we what? Might become. Might become. Might become. So what? What establishes the condition of righteousness? Now watch what Romans chapter 1, verse 17 says. And this isn't the only place it says this. We're after what establishes the condition of righteousness. What establishes that we're, we're Daniel is guilty of being righteous. Not doing a righteous act, but being sentenced and declared He's righteous. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written. But the righteous man shall live by faith. The righteous man shall what? Live by faith. Okay. So who's, how do we, you and I walk in the condition of righteousness? What's the verse 17 say? Well, notice what it says. The righteous man shall do what? Live by faith. Notice it and say, believe like point action it's saying what live by faith so guess what so let me ask you a question can i not live by faith yeah. can i cut myself off from the grace of god what did we say early on in the beginning that how can you cut yourself off from the grace of god remember one you who are seeking to be justified by the law you have fallen from grace you have been severed from christ so i seek to be justified by the law I'm not living by faith. So guess what? I'm not walking in the what? Right. I'm not walking in, well, Q, Q went to another level. I'm not walking in the righteousness of God. So therefore, I'm not what, Q? Just walking. I'm not walking in grace. God's calling us to walk in abundant grace. So what releases the grace of God into our lives is the righteousness of God. But there are acts of righteousness. There are conditions of righteousness. Let me give you a couple examples of where an act of righteousness releases the grace of God. Luke chapter 6, verse 32. Now we're, we're after where an act of righteousness releases grace into our life. Okay? Watch this. Uh, let me, I'm going to read it because I'm going to stop and start. Okay? Watch this. If you love those who love you, and the, and the American Standard says this, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? But guess what? The Greek word for credit is not, it's not credit. It's the Greek word kateris. So if you love those who love you, what grace is that to you? Even the sinners love them. Verse 33, if you do good to those who do good to you, what grace is that to you? 34, if you lend to those whom you expect to, re to receive, what grace is that to you? Where credit is, it's grace. So what we're seeing is there'll be acts 
There'll be things that happen in our lives that will come across our lives here. It's, it's loving those that are not going to love us in return, giving to those who give in return, you know, are not going to give in return. There'll be those opportunities. And guess what those opportunities are? Opportunities of what? Grace. Grace. Opportunities of grace. Because an act of righteousness is established and, and it's a releasing grace into our lives. There's this place of living by faith, but there is another thing about where there will be times and effects that God will bring. Well, I have to think, be honest with you, I'll take it. I think Satan brings these things around to tempt us, and God, being the cool God that He is, is causing all things to work out for good, just like He did where Satan crucified Jesus. You know, and like it says in uh, 1 Corinthians 2, if the rulers of this world would not have, would have known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And so what will happen is Satan will bring these things into your lives, people giving you a hard time, and God saying, watch this. This is an opportunity for grace. There's a, there's a place of living by faith, but also there's a place, y'all, that entering into the grace of God in specific acts. That a situation negative situation becomes an opportunity of grace. This sort of gets DM where we, are, we were got talking about, you asked me a question last week where we were talking about government. And I think, I believe this is that some of the things are happening in our government now that are not cool. We've got rulers doing some things that are not cool. But I think it's what? An opportunity of grace. So how do we respond in it? Go to 1 Peter 2, 2.19. For this finds favor. If for the... Uh, take favor out. Grace. grace. That's what it is, Caterice. For this finds favor or grace. Finds grace. Yes. If for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. Suffering unjustly. Christians are suffering unjustly in our government now. According to this verse, how we respond in it finds what? Grace. Hebrews 4.16. Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and what? Find grace. How's one of the ways that we find grace? Is when we're what? Being treated unjustly. Read verse 20. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. Favor is grace. So if you patiently endure it, this finds grace with God. I've introduced to you two things. One is I'm talking about the state or condition of righteousness, and that comes by living by faith. But what I'm also introduced to you right in the middle of it is, is that there are specific events that will occur in our life that are opportunities of grace. But one more, uh, first, first Peter 3, 9 and 10. Those of you who know me, you know, this is one of my you know, verses that I love. Now, you don't see grace in this because remember, but you're going to see the effects of grace. Grace takes you to a level you can't attain on your own. Watch this, uh, 3, 8 and 9. Can you read that? To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called to for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Get that. Insulted justice. Court of justice. Courtroom of heaven. You're insulted, and if you, you insult in return, justice. Can God give you grace? Can God bless you? No. Because if he blesses when you're and you insult in return, guess what? You unbalance the scales of justice. You're done evil. You give evil in return. So, you know, like the guys I shared with you all with us that stole a million dollars from me. Well, I was entertaining anger. According to Matthew chapter five, anger is like what? Murder. <laughs> so they're guilty of stealing. I'm guilty of what? Murder in the courtroom of heaven. So it says not returning evil. So evil's done. I give evil. Scales of justice are balanced. 
But instead, guess what? So I have evil done to me. I bless. Grace is given to me. And I didn't use grace. But notice what it says. I inherit a what? Blessing. Blessing. That's where human. Someone steals a million, a million dollars for us. We get angry. Can we go back and say, hey, that's not cool and reimbalance the scales to reaccess God's grace? I believe we can. Because okay. he did in my life. <laughs> he did in my life. I guess in the terms of like government, when a situation occurs of something that is not right, and then you have the opportunity to stand with other believers in worship or not be okay with that scenario, is that a form of doing grace in a positive way, but also standing up for your beliefs or foundation in Christ. This is going to sound, I'm not escaping something. It's got to do with the intent of the heart. It really does. I mean, Daniel about said the same scenario, did the same scenario as you just mentioned. Daniel, it was a law passed for Daniel not to pray. Okay. Well, Daniel's custom was every day he prayed. He didn't do, he didn't do, he prayed just as he always did with a pure heart. So let's think about it this way. So Daniel, okay, just his heart was to just seek the Lord. So he did. So he gets thrown in the lion's den. Well, he got a bunch of grace. He was able to go to a level of living that he could not attain on his own. So God shut the mouths of the lions. So to answer your question, yes. I mean, that would be a, a, a really good response. The question is, though, is here, because I can worship the Lord going, you know, in spite of you, I'm going to, you know, I, uh, yeah, I'm going to worship you, God, you know, instead of like, God, I, we just need you as a country, Lord, we need you. We intercede, for, you know, we just ask your will to come, Lord, your kingdom come. Mercy on our land, Lord, mercy, you know. So for those who are like who are in leadership, instead of, making judgments on them when we're worshiping, you know, pray for them. That's what like first Timothy two says, pray for Kings and rulers. And that's written in the context of Roman rulers, you know, that were not too cool. So, yeah, I mean, your, 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 your statement is, yeah, that'd be opportunity for grace. Question is, is what's going on here. You know, why, why am I doing it and how am I doing it? So, yeah, I mean, that'd be a good response. I mean, I think it's a great response. Oh, what was the, I guess, the grace released in Stephen's life when he was about to be stoned? This is going to sound um, religious, maybe. But, man, he saw God. Yeah. That's a bunch of grace. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, never again was he to suffer again. I mean, he saw the Lord, and he goes, okay. <laughs> And I guarantee you this, it's like when Stephen, if Stephen had that choice right now, I mean, here he is being stoned and there's God and Stephen's going, all right, Lord, raise me from the dead. Stephen's going, no, 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 no. I didn't see this. I want this. I'll never forget when Jen Cesario died. I, you know, I, I was out at Kairos putting up shades in a yurt. And all of a sudden, I get a call from, we Paul and I get a call from Beverly Taylor saying that Jen had died at church. So I get in the car, and I'm at Cairo, so it's almost an hour from, an hour probably, an hour and 15 minutes probably from Cairo to the church. So I'm praying, I'm going, I'm, I'm leave, I've left there and I've got one intent purpose. I'm going to pray that God raise her from the dead. I mean, that's what I was, that's where I was headed. And I'll never forget, I was coming over. It was a clear night, clear you know, sun was setting. I'm coming over Brush Mountain and I'm praying hard. All of a sudden, I, I hear, I, I'm just going to say it. I, I, I heard a voice that sounded just like Jen Cesario. <laughs> and I hear it says, what, how Jen would, you know, Jen loved me and she, 
you know, she believed in Paul and I, and, you know, she was awesome. She didn't, but I heard her say, don't you dare pray raise <laughs> from, from the dead. I don't have nothing to do with it. That's <laughs> a paraphrase. I, I can't remember the last part, but I heard her say, don't you dare pray to raise me from the dead. You know, and I go, okay, Lord. Okay, Jen. Because <laughs> you know? she got graced from our side. We're going, come on, Jen, back. But, you know, I will say this, and I'll say this, and then we need to press on. But I don't know how many of y'all went to her funeral, the, the memorial service at DP. But, you know, our hearts were heavy that, you know, Jen gone to be with Jesus. But I, one thing became apparent that night to me when all these testimonies were coming forth about Jen's life, that, that Jen sort of did a second Timothy chapter, you know, for I've run the race, I finished the course. And, you know, it was kind of interesting to me that, like, I had met with Jen like a week or so before she died. You know, she was just really troubled going, not troubled, but she just was being attacked with, am I fulfilling my purpose? Am I, you know, you know, what am I doing? And then, man, in that, in that, few, that memorial service, you go, you did it, Jen. You did it. And so, anyway, that, that's what I say with Stephen. I say he got graced. Yeah, I had another lady tell me one time, she said, Sizemore, don't you dare pray over me to raise me from the dead. <laughs> so I die. You better let me go. <laughs> to be absent in the body is to be uh, present with the Lord, you know. So, but I still pray for people to raise from the dead. So anyway, let me summarize this up. What is the word of his grace? How do I live by, how do I walk in grace? Well, a life of grace is a life of what? Faith. Faith. A life of grace is a life of faith. Now, John made a statement tonight. When I asked him, what releases the grace of God in our lives? Now, real quick, and I know, I don't I think I have to say much of this. Most of y'all know this. And that's a noun. So what's the verbs? What's the actions? And there are two. John said one, trust. And the other one, what is belief? And you have to go to the Old Testament to find this. And we'll go into this next week more and just real quick. But tonight, I just want to answer the question. Trust literally means to attach oneself to. You trust in Psalm 910 on God's nature and character. Those who know your name will put their trust in them. You trust when you do not have a word. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. You trust when you wake up in the morning, you don't know what to do. You just start declaring the nature and character of God. That's what the psalm, psalmist did in Psalm 92. In the morning, I declare thy loving kindness as at night, thy faithfulness. When I'm laying down at night, that's one of the th first things that, that I'm trying to do when I go to bed, when I go to sleep. I'm trying to declare the, the faithfulness of God. Last night, I'm, I'm, the last thing I was declaring before I went to sleep was Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High and will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And it goes on to talk about his faithfulness as a shield and a bulwark. So you trust. You start declaring God's nature and character in your life. You're attaching your heart to his nature and character. Guess what it does? It releases the grace of God into your life. You know, Lauren, you were saying the other day, you were talking about, you were just holding fast the part about he'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you. Wasn't it you? That's God's nature and character. So Lauren didn't have a specific word. She's trusting in God's nature and character. And guess what? Grace is there. Believe is what you do when you have a word. It means to make firm. So when God gives you a word about something, what you should do, you make it firm. Like Abraham believed God and was counted in him as righteousness. So what's God saying? What's God saying in your situation, your circumstance? What's he saying? If he, if he gives you a word, make it firm. If he doesn't say anything, all right, God, I know your nature and character. And so operate in it. And that's how you walk in and step into grace. And that's where, John, you said 
trust. Well, you were right on. But what I wanted you to understand was, well, trust establishes righteousness. And when you trust, you're attaching your heart to the nature and character of God. You know, you said it right, but there was a whole lot behind what you were saying, which was big. Like, would it be another facet of believing is to rely on God? Yeah, let me say yes and no. Okay, yes. Let me, let me do the no first. This is the Hebrew word for belief. It means to make firm. Like, this is a word from the Lord. I'm making it firm. Okay. Now, John, what you're saying is lean or have the same effect. Yes. To answer your question, yes. No, it's not believing, but it's, it, but it's just like it. It's another form of these two. Do not lean on your own understanding. Yeah, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean. Don't trust in your own understanding. Yeah, you're right. Only lean means lean. This is trust. So I'm blindfolded. So I'm attached. I'm trusting Q. Okay. This is lean. I mean, literally in scripture. So, so <laughs> now you're Jesus. <laughs> you're firm, brother. <laughs> so, so I'm leaning. So yes, but it's just two different things. You following me? Yeah. And that's where you'll see, see, you'll see. Lean doesn't get used a whole lot, but it's there. It is there. Uh, it, is, well, it talks about it as a couple of the kings you know, leaned on the Lord. They relied on the Lord. Yeah, that's good. That's, you're, sharp, you're sharp, John. Let me get back to Pat. I asked her a while ago, what was the word of grace? Here's what I, I'm just call a lie, let God be established. But really simple with the word of grace is a life of faith either believing in his word or trusting in his nature and character. Really simple. When you get up in the morning, you want to operate in grace, believe in his word or trusting his nature and character. Here's the thing I say to you is this. Don't wake up in the morning and start thinking what you got to go do. Wake up in the morning going, okay, God, what are you saying this morning? I mean, you can do that. I just said it. Who are you, God? And that's where the psalmist would say, in the morning I declare thy loving kindness. So he would start to declare the loving kindness of God. Psalm 90, verse 14 says, Oh, satisfy me in the morning with your loving kindness that I may sing for joy and be glad all my days. That's grace. Joy. It's a release of grace. Start declaring his loving kindness. I, I took a computer program and printed out all the verses that had loving kindness in the old testament and all the verses that had faithfulness and i went through them and started memorizing them so that when i got pushed to get up in the morning start declaring loving kindnesses night faithfulness pick it apart okay i know we went a lot of stuff but you know went technical but this is ministry, this is advanced ministry training my heart is that you understand why something works, what's behind it, so that, you know, if it's broke, you can fix it. Not, you know, I just know how to operate a car. You understand how the car is put together. You understand how grace is put together. There's a whole lot more we could say in this. So a life of faith, believing in his word or trusting in his nature and character. But realize there are times that there'll be acts of righteousness. What you're doing is literally you're trusting in the nature and character of God. Or God may have said to you, just love them. When those guys stole a million dollars from us, we prayed about it. And God said, let it go. What he told us was this. <laughs> don't, this don't sound very spiritual, but this is what he told us. Don't throw good money after bad money. In other words, don't spend a whole bunch of money on lawyers and for money that's right now, it's, it's bad. So we didn't, but God gave us grace in the future in that word of grace, life of faith, believing in his word, trusting in his promises. It's real simple. Now I will throw you another curve. There's another thing that releases grace and it's humility. 
but you can say word of his grace is a, a life of humility, <laughs> living by faith, but humility and faith are the same thing. Where does honor fit in and all that? The people stole the million using that example. There had to be a place of honor where you're not bashing those dudes in your heart in order to actually, I guess, I guess in my mind, I would kind of like throw sneak that in there to in order to be able to operate in that faith. But I just wanted to kind of pose that as a question of where does honor, does honor fit in? And if so, where? Well, I, how I would equate honor, holiness, um, perfect. Um, a lot of these characteristics of God, I, to me, it's trust. It's where you're stepping into a situation and you're operating in the nature and character of who God is. God is a God of honor. Jesus honored his father. So I would say honor is, tr is a, it's really, it's a place of trust. And I'm going to use John's thing about leaning. When you honor, you're not leaning on your own understanding. You're leaning on the Lord. Yeah, you're just stepping into it as you're just trusting in who God. Yeah, Lord, I, I would say is, is that all of a sudden you're in a situation. You see a leader that's, that's screwing up, a father in the faith that's screwing up, and God's calling you to honor. To cover his nakedness. Not making excuses for sin, but he's just weak. He's making... So you go, Lord, this is who you are. God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to operate as you in this situation. So I grant honor, Lord. That's how I would say it in my heart. Falls under like a faith category, if you will. Like, like just the way you have it written there, it seems like trust and believe goes under faith, which it does. So just seems like that, that all ties into there. Uh, what, you know, what you said, God's a God of honor. So it's, it's your job to trust and believe that he's going to operate that way. It's like it's not your job to, to play God. Yeah, David honored Saul because that's who his God was. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment where we can fellowship with one another and most importantly to fellowship with you. Thank you for this revelation you have given us through your word. We ask that your word would take hold on our hearts, O oh Lord, that we will walk in it, O oh Lord, that we will work it, O oh Lord. We pray, O oh Lord, coming against every forces of darkness that will come and try to steal your word away from us, O oh God. We just want to treasure your word so much that we will not sin against you. Help us, O oh Lord, to live by faith, O oh God, and in turn, um, um, get your grace, O oh Lord. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you are leading us in every step of the way. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen.